Welcome to another project breakdown. Today we're looking at the thorn that I did the color grade for. This was a feature length project that went to theater via Fathom. It has some live stage kind of musical components to it and also some more cinematic narration that's interspersed throughout the film. Let's dig in. When conforming this project, there were a couple of unique factors that I had to work with. One of them in, in the editing software, there had been developed this kind of adjustment clip that it needed to be recreated. You can come right over here to effects and click adjustment clip and, and put this in here. It, it operates just as like a standalone clip. You can drag it as much as needed and then you can apply effects onto here. For example, with this one, what they had created was there's a set of clips underneath. So it lets you see right through. They used keyframes here to uh, make the image underneath slowly increase over time without having to individually keyframe each shot. So we just recreated this here, got rid of the old one. Um, so just little things like that need to be reflected. I had the editor export a reference from his timeline that also had a layer for clip name and time code. I can go to link offline reference clip, the thorn locked to color, this is the, the reference then set this window to offline. There I have the information. If I need to reference the original material and need to reline something back up, but there were some areas that the image needed to be relined up. I right clicked in this one, click difference. If it's out of line, so then you can easily see where it's out of line and you can then use these tools, in this case, we'll reset it, to reposition to make sure that it matches the original, the original shot. And we can go through shot by shot and make sure these are all lined up. And this is a helpful way of matching that up without having to just eyeball it every time. A few of the clips in the project had retiming controls that were done on the editing side. In this case, we were exporting a final finished full version of the movie. So some of these needed to be baked in from the color side and not so it didn't have to be reapplied in the edit. Uh, you can right click, retime controls, and then you can see where the points were. Part of it was a ramp so we would go to retime curve and then right click on this little arrow and turn off the retime frame. Make sure retime speed is selected. And then for each one of these points, it would switch it from this one to this one so that it got you more of a curve and it didn't just jump right into the retiming. It's a little trickier than I think the way Premiere handles some of the retiming because uh, in Premiere you could get more of a linear run into the next keyframe. And these just took a lot more work to make sure the clip was precisely the same length. All these little tools are helpful in replicating what that looked like uh, when the shot came in and making sure that conformed properly. To start the project, I took one angle that was pretty wide and that was used throughout. And the way I could find that is by going to Clips, Common Media Pool Source. And I could quickly see that this camera angle was used significantly all the way from the beginning of the show all the way to the end of the show. And it's this big, a uh, boom shot that, that's very wide and great for setting looks. I would select a set of, of clips and then create a version for that and then name it. And then I would go through another scene, another scene, and then end up developing more consistent looks for some of these fire and, and red scenes or the blue to use as I went through and graded the rest of the shots around that particular scene. Invariably, there would need to be individual adjustments made two clips that would be somewhat similar as you can see here, but I would need a different version because the surrounding clips and context needed to be adjusted or the lighting changed or the colors of that were on, you know, on the stage changed. And so I need something different. And so I would take that base version still and then iterate it into one other version and make my own changes per clip. And then would use the, this common source media to make sure that I'm not accidentally referencing where these these pink remote connected clips are somewhere way down the line somewhere else in the film way up here that i'm then you know making making adjustments to and accidentally making making changes what we ended up with is 53 different versions on this one angle some of these end up being very similar and you could quickly click through which versions but just to keep it cleaner once i got into it to make sure that we're not rippling those changes into scenes that i don't want them into i erred on the side of more versions than probably necessary just to get that individual look without having to go quite to local grades and still being able to use remote grades as was helpful for for each of the scenes after i had the base grades made 
uh, with all those seven different different versions. Then I also went through my key highlight clips that I started with and saved off a still and titled it with the name of the grade that I had, just so I could, for easy reference, one, put this up against the new clips I'm working on so that I can grade them to match the scene. But then also I can remember kind of the, the, the grade that was used for that scene so I knew which ones to use going forward. What I can easily do is this, go through here and reference uh, which scenes these go with and can tell that uh, because of the source time code, 34 minutes, 34 minutes, these are all very closely related and all likely the same scene. So I'll leave all of these connected. We'll go down here to the scene with Jesus, apply this, and this is looking pretty close. We may need to do some other final tweaks once we get in. 36, 37, this one might be a little brighter. Later in grading, I may need to version this one up just to just to be able to make the adjustments I need to. Then usually I'll go in here, rename this one, just so I know it was a version five, is the name of the original grade that I'm using here. And I've used it so much, gone through the project, I kind of know what version five, this is the pretty standard one I'm using on most clips. And then I'm also going here and flag, Cream, I just picked cream because it was kind of easy to see and didn't have any main significance to it. Actually, let me go back. Because I rested on this one, it'll kick me to that point in the project. I want to go back here. So we'll select that one, select all clips, and it'll take me back to the main project. And so then I'll go through, find which ones are not flagged as cream, and do the same thing again. Common media source pool, sometimes it's just one. And so we'll just grade that as an individual clip. I'm using versions as groups because I already have Canon footage and Blackmagic footage. Blackmagic is a whole different sequence of things that they filmed. And so to separ I've separated those into groups because with the Canon live stage footage, there needs to be some noise reduction that happens. And so I've put that into a group to be able to apply that across. Otherwise, I could be doing these as groups and doing the other adjustments um, and switching the groups they're in. I still think this is a little better and faster because I can hover these other memories and, and stills to see which version and grade I want and then can name those appropriately for each set of cameras for each scene. Uh, this has been my attempt to try to break this down as simplified as much as possible with as many multi-cam sections as there are and trying to kind of do broad strokes across first and then come back through and do some matching without these remote grades transitioning all the way across scenes that are being used like we just saw all the way you know up and down the, the film they're, they're a little more localized in the way the remote grade version uh, translates in the project we did have a handful of visual effects shots that we needed to do mostly painting out cameras and such if we turn off the raw grade, you can kind of see this boom arm and a camera up here. And so they would get those painted out with visual effects. I import them into a visual effects folder here. We would drag and line it up. And then this had handles on either end, a little extra. So we would trim those off. And then because I graded on the original shot, we could just reapply that grade and it all came through just right. Then I turned the other layer off so that in color, we didn't get mixed up between the two shots. And I also tagged any visual effects with a little yellow flag just so I could quickly sort and find them if I needed to in the color page. When replacing visual effects shots, I make sure the new clip also gets assigned to the group that the previous shot had. That it, This visual effects shot wipes from, this is black magic footage, over to the Canon footage from the stage production. It doesn't work very well to do a color grade between the two different camera formats. Uh, with the different conversion settings and whatever. Um, so this worked really well to have the alpha matte version, which just revealed then the shot we had underneath. And we were able to keep those two separate, but then still blend them through the visual effects as the director wanted. One of the special effects sequences we had is this opening sequence. The character John is having a dream. This is the raw version here. And then we I did a, a, a conversion LUT for Canon to get this back into a working space. Um, here we brighten it up. And then for this, we want to do a special treatment where we did everything black and white except for the color red. But it was popping a little too much, so we darkened that back down to be a little more muted. And then uh, one of the things I added was a zoom blur 
and added a, a center exclusion here so that it doesn't cover the whole image and allows his hands and some of the middle to still be focused on and not be too distracting. I also added a prism blur to give a little more distortion, especially here on the edges. And this was set to only be in channel one, not all three channels. We did add some distortion on the edges to provide a little more of that kind of dreamy off balance feel. And then based on director's notes, we wanted to dim it down a little bit more to match and also warm it up before and after. One of the areas in the film that has some heavy effects applied is a kind of flashback, a little bit of a dream sequence. And so we're starting with some of the regular footage here and then basic conversion in, uh, into 709. And then we wanted to do a black and white look for this one to help set it apart. And then because it was a little bit blurry, I also did a power window here and some sharpening to bring some focus into the middle area. Then we have a tilt blur that's applied from the effects panel. And we applied a glow to the area. We're going all out dreamy flashback. Then we have a radial blur to kind of blur and smear out these edges. And in that, I did a power window to exclude the center to help continue keeping the focus here without blurring out the whole thing. Uh, also added in a touch of vignette on the edge and then using that same power window mask, applied that into this other channel that we also did a smear so that as it plays, it has a little bit of a kind of a ghosting smoothing effect on the image. It takes a little bit of processing to uh, get this, get this clip to render out, but here's the before and after, and we did this to a number of shots here in this sequence with some slight variations as necessary to each of the shots. Honestly, these cave shots didn't need a lot of work. This is the image with the basic camera LUT that we started with. And then, so just some basic correction and then some color tweaks. I did use one power window to slightly brighten up the center and then to darken some of the edges just to draw your attention back a little bit of saturation here and then a glow just on these candles to add just a little bit of pop. And so with just a few minor tweaks, it helps enhance, but it's, it's really not doing a lot of work. We're just barely adding to what was there. We had a great starting point to work from. Here's an example from the cave scenes of the treatment we did here. This is using a camera LUT that they used while filming to get this converted over into um, Rec. 709 to start with. And then just a starting pass here, getting some color adjusted, a little bit of saturation. I did it on, on some of these scenes where you can see this moonlight coming through in these angles is add the effects light ray effect onto this clip. It's just to kind of add to what's already there. And then a subtle glow to the firelight before and after. There's a signature moment as they're talking about creation in the story. It has this orb and so after doing the other corrections and you know basic grading work, I added a glow effect. And you can see in some of these other shots as she moves around, there's a subtle glow effect applied to help it stand out uh, as she's moving through this sequence. I used some of the qualifiers here to limit it down just so it would only be on the areas that would select this color and this brightness and turn down even the selection of shadow over here so that we're just selecting this area without having to draw any windows and tracking. For some reason, some of the stage lighting that was supposed to be a little bit more of a royal blue came in as a purple with the way the cameras rendered the color. I didn't actually do a whole lot to this shot except to go in and tweak using hue versus hue to get these shots a little more towards the color of blue that they were supposed to be. So just by selecting a little bit more of a teal color. And then of course we had to go through each one of the shots and and go through and tweak the adjustments as the color changed from the wides to the close-ups and uh, get all these blues then to match across um, but this definitely was coming through with a pretty magenta purple hue right off the bat i mean this is no color at all applied and you can still see how it's coming in raw and so that which is something we worked with the director to take a couple of notes here and shift that back using the hue versus hue Okay, so when this one got converted over, we were also finding here that this magenta pink color is coming in really, really hot and oversaturated. 
uh, for the image. So did a couple of corrections to pull that way back and then also correcting that back into more of a blue purple than a magenta purple, of, which is closer to what the director was looking for. One of the sequences in the movie is this exterior scene by the ocean. It's beautiful. And the trick is they shot it on the West Coast and it needs to play as a sunrise. And some of this was shot a little out of order. So trying to help this fit in, we darken some of this down because uh, we still need this to kind of cut with a shot like this. And so we're gonna bring it down uh, darken some of these edges, you know, put a little more blue back in the sky and the blues help play it a little more sunrise, uh, you know, plus a few little windows to bring some focus to where we want to be looking at. Uh, this is before, so we definitely have a lot of shadows here on the beach and not a lot of uh, saturation and color up here in the sky and then added some power windows to highlight the beach. So these are long stretches of light uh, trying to replicate some of the uh, some of the sunlight, and then we also tracked tracked those into the shot as well, so they're not bouncing around because this is a handheld shot, and um, and then this we had this group node. This is just shifting a little bit of those blues into into teal, and helping with the overall kind of filmic cinematic look we had going on. I knew the show would benefit from even a slight denoising pass to just help smooth some of this out, and uh, so what I ended up doing is created a a smart filter for Canon. That's, uh, they were shot on the C500. And then by selecting everything, put that into a group. And then to that group node, applied this amount of blur with a little bit of temporal with some spatial. I decided to do a pre-render. And what I did is I went through and made markers in the timeline and set in and out points. And then by using the settings for what I knew we were gonna deliver, I pre-rendered each of these sections, which I then brought back into the project under what I call pre-renders, and these are for markers, and I had different versions, and I would drag them back into the project here and lay them on top and not need to re-render it. And as we had visual effects or something else come in, I would make a cut in, in this clip to reveal what was underneath it. And then as I re-rendered that clip, it would then you know, incorporate those new changes that have been made. And then I could, this is why there's versions here. This one's version three. I wanted to bring it back in, replace this one. This ended up being a good method for us and uh, cut the render time from about four and a half hours to about 45 minutes uh, in rendering the entire program. Well, thank you all for watching. Hopefully this has been helpful and uh, possibly even mildly entertaining. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and hit the like button. And uh, if you have any thoughts or comments, I would love to hear from you. Leave me a comment. See you next time.